is recognized for his leadership in his 40 years of public service. Wow. In 1990, he was elected to represent the Northern District on the Hartford County Council. He went on to the Maryland House of Delegates and in 2010 was elected to the Maryland Senate. In 2014, Mr. Glassman was elected as Harford County Executive. He was appointed by Governor Hogan to the Maryland Economic Development Corporation Board of Directors. In 2019, he was elected President of the Maryland Association of Counties a longtime supporter of Hartford County's 4-H. He is a husband, a father, and a recent grandfather. I give you Mr. Barry Glassman. Grandfather got you a biggest smile. It did. I, I know. I always, uh, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. I always tell folks, no matter what happens uh, in this election, since I became a grandfather and I get that toothless smile, he's only 16 months old, uh, I know I'm a winner no matter, uh, no matter what, you know? Uh, it is good to be here. Uh, I always remind folks I've been blessed to have uh, serve as a county councilman, a state delegate, a state senator, and current county executive of Harper County, which is the eighth largest uh, county in Maryland. But I also remind folks I'm retired from Baltimore Gas Electric Company. I did work uh, a real job. I think some folks, some, they see all that political stuff and they, they want to know that you actually uh, earned a check every week. And I, I did uh, work for Baltimore Gas Electric Company for 25 years and had to retire when I became a uh, full-time executive. That's part of the Hartford County cha Charter. You got to give up your, your job. So you wondered about the 4-H. In addition to that, uh, I had a small sheep farm. I'm the guy that has a little sheep sometimes on the sign, you'll see. The young people say Barry instead of Barry, right? Uh, and so I grew up on a small farm in Hartford County in a little village called Level, L-E-V-E-L. Uh, in level, they had a volunteer fire company, a general store, and a garage. The most notable thing about level, it's spelled forward the same way it is backwards, all right? That is about it. Uh, and on that small farm, I became a volunteer fireman and an EMT early, early on. That's where I kind of learned public service. Uh, my father had a farm, we sold cattle. My mother's a retired federal employee, worked at Aberdeen Proving Ground as the property book officer. Uh, and she worked long and hard. And back then, I think she used to come home and she probably made uh, 30 cents on a dollar what the guy did the same job for. Yep. Sometimes that doesn't go over real well, but I think it's a fact uh, 50 years ago uh, that women did not get paid equal to the same job. They and, still do uh, And they still do I hear that right. <laughs> uh, and so I, I've been blessed to do this. If you look at the last six candidates that are left on this statewide office, I am the only candidate that has run a multi-billion dollar county, balanced the pension system, and in Harper County, unlike the state, my pension system is 100% funded. Uh, OPEB Medical Arc is funded 100% into the future. Uh, we do procurement and a lot of the technical jobs that Comptroller does. And, and I know when you think about Comptroller, the biggest thing people think is, well, that's the tax person. That's the guy that collects the taxes. Uh, but in fact, the Comptroller is one of the three uh, highest uh, elected positions in the state of Maryland. Not only the tax collector, but sits on the Board of Public Works, uh, issues contracts, spends billions, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, on, federal, on state contracts for services. He's also the chair of the revenue estimating, uh, the person that has a board that has to tell the governor and legislature in that magic ball how much money they think they have to spend, how much they need to cut, how they're going to balance their budget. Uh, in addition to that, 
also works with the register of wills, infrastructure on uh, internet. So it's a big job. It's I hate to say it's not that exciting. I try to make it exciting, but it is a very technical uh, but important job. And, and I always say in those three, you've got the governor, the executive branch, uh, you have the legislative branch, which is the legislature, uh, and you've got the comptroller. I, I have a traditional view of the comptroller as being the representative of the taxpayer to make sure every dollar is spent wisely and every dollar is returned that is justly due back to the taxpayer and that you work uh, to make sure small businesses and everyone in the state is able to pay their taxes, run their businesses, and do it promptly. And we've got work to do there. Uh, I, I think one of the first things I would do that we did in Harper County is to really come in and do a digital upgrade to make sure the infrastructure, the digital platforms are there in the comptroller's office to make sure customer service is number one but also to make sure these regional offices are staffed. Uh, and you know, not everyone wants to play on the smartphone or go on the internet to get an answer. You ought to be able to call on the phone and have someone answer, to give you your answers, to help you as you work through any of the tax questions that you may have. And so I would ask you, when you look at this election, one other thing since the primary, that I've always been kind of a moderate. I'm a fiscal conservative. Uh, Hartford County, we uh, have a great fiscal record. Uh, but I tell you, we need, when we think about what's gonna happen in Annapolis, you wanna think about a check and balance. Someone that can go to Annapolis with the experience uh, to provide balance. Someone that can say yes or no to the governor, yes or no to the legislature and represent you, uh, the taxpayer. And, and that's what it really boils down to when we start thinking about November. Uh, I served in Annapolis. I know that one party control is not always the most effective. It's usually the most expensive. Uh, and whether you're a Democrat, Republican, or independent, it makes sense to have differing uh, opinions and views down there. You need someone there that can strike that kind of balance. And that's what we plan to do uh, as Maryland's next comptroller. So I don't want to burn too much of my time there. I know you have some questions. I can give you some additional information. First, I want to thank you for being here. My name is Paul Schwartz. I am the state, uh, the chair of the Maryland North State Legislation Committee. And I have several questions for you. It feels like Passover. <laughs> Uh, the state of Iowa recently passed a tax reform package that fully excludes all retirement income from state income taxation, including federal retirement annuities under both CSRS and FERS. My question is, if Iowa can do this, in your view, what are the hurdles preventing Maryland from doing the same thing and, in so doing, making Maryland a more attractive state in which to retire? Yeah, so clearly, as... Uh Delegate Cox mentioned, the executive, the governor, and the legislature have to get on board with this. As, as comptroller, your job is to implement what they decide to do. Uh, but let me just tell you what my record reflects, not only in the legislature, but as Hartford County Executive, we have one of the only big eight uh, programs where I give a 20%, I adopted a 20% reduction in our property taxes for senior citizens and veterans. Uh, and that has been approved each year, and I've currently got a bill before the county council to extend that another 10 years. So I know it can be done. It, it takes a budgeting effort to set aside those funds. Uh, I did it in Harper County. We have a great military presence with Aberdeen Proving Ground and senior citizens. 
But you hear what I hear when folks say, Barry, we can't afford to stay in Hartford County uh, between property tax, state income tax, that we need a break to be able to stay with our children, to be able to afford and keep our, our farms and our homes. Uh, and so, uh, although I can't adopt it, I would be supportive uh, of doing that. Uh, and I think it can be done. Like I say, if Iowa can do it, then uh, I don't see why Maryland can. One of the justifications, next question is, one of the justifications for not moving forward on decoupling... School notes are like attorney general opinions down there. If you, they write them the way they want them written to get the bill passed. I, I hate to say that, but they, they are very subjective, uh, and I, I, I wouldn't... Whenever I voted on a bill like that, I wouldn't really take everything into consideration in that fiscal note. Uh, sitting on the committee, we usually didn't get them for a couple hours before the bill was to be heard and voted on. So that's how much weight uh, would be put into those. So, and, and you know, the, the digital programs are there. I, I think um, there's really no excuse to do that. Uh, as you know, um, the SALT provisions for those states uh, has been a windfall. One of the reasons we have a surplus, and uh, I have to say even in, in counties, uh, on the local portion that we get from the state, we have done better because of that too. So, there, and, and my philosophy always has been, since we've done better, I've reinvested that back to the taxpayers with my senior veteran tax cut uh, for the last two years, uh, doing the uh, standard uh, minimum on property taxes, and this year uh, adopted a full nickel reduction in the property tax rate for everyone. So to, to try to, you know, I think when I talk about balance, you have to have balance not only in revenue, but taxpayers deserve some of that balance back on their side too. Well, that brings us to this next question. The 2017 federal tax plan eliminated or reduced many middle class tax deductions resulting in a, as you just said, a windfall of several hundred million dollars for our state coffers. When Comptroller Peter Francho was asked by me whether any of that windfall should be returned to Maryland taxpayers, he indicated his preference was to place it in a rainy day fund. Since the windfall exists each and every tax year and will do so every year the eliminated deductions are not reinstated, my question is, what is your preference for use of that money? And I think you yeah. covered some I, of I may have covered some of that because yeah. what my philosophy has been is that approach. Listen, I understand it with it with inflation and we probably are in the early, very early stages, if not in, in a two or three months of a recession or a slowdown uh, in the country. And and when you're running a local or state government, you gotta keep an eye on that so you can pay the bills later on. Uh, but listen, you have to have balance. You, I, I think you need to reinvest half that back uh, to the taxpayer. You can still, in, in Hartford County, I came into office with an $8 million uh, general fund balance, which was very low. When I leave here in the fall, it will be $35 million. But at the same time, we've been able to fully fund education and public safety and do a $43 million tax cut. So. It's the balance. You, you can, folks will tell you you can't do both, but you can. Uh, speaking of the fiscal note, what is your view of dynamic scoring as it relates to prioritizing state expenditures? Just specifically, what is your view of fiscal notes basically applying costs and revenue loss over a five-year period rather than looking at the long-term impact of the expenditure as it relates to economic growth? Yeah, I, I mean, I would support that. Of course, that, that would be general services with, through legislative services. But um, I know, you know, as a county executive running a local government, my other county executives and would agree. And I, I spent a year representing all of Maryland's counties, little ones and big ones. And one thing we can agree on are uh, unfunded mandates. And when the state just whether you're for or against the blueprint uh, for education, which is a major investment and a new program to fund public school systems into the future, uh, those fiscal notes are a perfect example. All the state's investment and expenditures on that program are based on three-year-old numbers when inflation was 2% and revenue was 7%. 
So think about where we are today when we're getting ready to start the second year of the blueprint uh, with 10% inflation and revenue down to 3%. So you can throw all that out the window. You need to be more precise on a year by year basis. Thank you. Next question is, would you be in favor of a tax incentive to encourage the purchase of long-term care insurance at a younger age and to enable those with long-term care insurance to afford to keep it as, mean, as a means of keeping them in their homes longer before entering nursing homes, which as I'm sure you know, accounts for most of the Medicaid impact on the state budget. Yeah. I, I would be a supportive. As comptroller, I would make sure that the uh, programming is there to implement it. Of course, the, the governor and the legislature are gonna have to adopt it, uh, but I would promote it that we can, listen, I wanna have that office in a position instead of always saying, no, we don't have the people, we don't have the programming, to be able to say, if you pass it, we can do it, we'll get that help out uh, to our taxpayers. That's the kind of approach I want to take to it. Yeah, I would think that the windfall would more than cover a few extra. Uh, you would think. <laughs> uh, the homeowner's tax credit is currently limited to low income. Would you be in favor of expanding the homeowner's tax credit to those over 65 as a means of helping to stem the tide of senior migration to more tax friendly states. Yes, I, I would, and I, I think if you look at what we've done in Harper County with our property tax reductions for seniors and so forth, we've shown that you can do it and market it, and, and, and folks are appreciative. It has been my most successful program, uh, just that 20% property tax reduction. So I would be in support of that, and you know, and as comptroller, I think it's important to get out there also and talk about savings, whether it's for college. I believe the younger you start saving, uh, the better, but also for our senior citizens to be an advocate to make sure uh, that they can live and stay here and prosper in the state also. Yeah, as we like to say, uh, you may move down to uh, Florida for the weather, but you don't go to retire in Delaware or Pennsylvania for the weather, right. the cost of living. Right. And in Penn and living in Harper County, I live six miles from the border, the Mason-Dixon line, and believe me, we, we see so many of our senior citizens go. There was somebody brought to my attention that there was a couple, a military couple, each getting their uh, government pension, uh, Social Security, and the military pension, and that they moved across the border from uh, Waldorf to Gettysburg and saved $24,000 on their taxes. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty significant. Yeah. Yeah. Which brings us to the last question, which is, my question is, does not reflect the rest of NARF. It's my personal question. Uh, and candidate Cox had indicated that it's a federal issue, but we still want to get your, your read on it. As a high-ranking state office holder, would you vocally support moving the Martin Luther King Jr. national holiday from the middle of January to Election Day in November to better honor Dr. King's efforts to protect voting rights and to obviate the need to create an additional national holiday. And the goal here is, of course, to make it easier for people to vote. Yeah, I'll probably, I'll probably have to kick the can on that one a little bit, too. I, uh, I just don't, I don't know enough to, to say I'd like to move that. I, I would defer to uh, Reverend King's family and, and his memory of what they wanted, uh, which to me is more important. So I would, I would probably defer to his family on that. Good answer. Mr. Glassman, uh, the grandfather <laughs> one really got the smiles. But you know when you plug my heart? When you talked about Aberdeen Proving Grounds, because our twin son is on active duty engineer and lieutenant colonel at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds. And so I give you a NARF coin in commemoration of everything. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all so much for having me. I appreciate it. Spread the word. Thank you. Thank you.